Hello, I'm Kimberly Romain, Editor-in-Chief at Unquote, Europe's longest-running private equity publication. I have with me here today my colleague Emmanuel Ftimu, and together we're going to be interviewing Adam Levin and Corinna Mitchell, both partners at international law firm Deckert. Thank you so much for joining us. First question to Adam. In the light of um, still illiquid debt markets and with a mountain of debt still to be refinanced in the next few years, can debt resets ease that pent-up pressure? Let's look at the scale of the mountain. Accountancy firm Deloitte has just published figures showing that $9 trillion worth of debt has to be uh, refinanced in the next four years. Now, when you think about it, that's a huge mountain. But on the other hand, we've had the largest debt buildup in history ever known. We think that we're having 12 to 18 months or so of uh, borrowers having to spend time in approaching new lenders. So it makes sense, actually, to go back to your existing borrowers and do the debt reset. We do have some signs, though, of, of uh, some activity in one of the debt markets. Um, it, the high yield market is uh, sort of back, at least at this point. Uh, this year, we've seen about $2 trillion worth of issuances in the States alone. That's quite a substantial amount, and uh, particularly up against the, the, the nine trillion that I mentioned earlier, it sounds like it's sort of doable. But the fact is that when you've got companies the like of MGM Mirage, uh, Del Monte, uh, and uh, the like tapping the debt market, the high yield debt market for money and getting it, that's a very good sign for, uh, for, for uh, borrowers who want an alternative to just going back to their banks um, for a, a debt reset. Thank you, Adam. You've brought up a lot of um, interesting and sometimes scary points. We have heard a lot about portfolio companies being restructured in these very difficult and challenging economic times. Ahead of what we're hearing about these restructurings, of course, private equity backers of these companies may look to seek amendments to the loan terms, or they may even look for covenant waivers outright. Corinna, what sort of things can trigger this? Well, typically what will happen is that a borrower will sit down and start its budgeting process for the next year or maybe the next half year. And whilst doing that budgeting and forecasting, a borrower may find out that actually it's pretty close to breaching its financial covenants in its debt documents. And at that stage, a borrower and its shareholders have got a question, which is whether they wait and hope that things get better, or whether they actually approach their lenders straight away and tell them that they've got this potential breach coming up and ask them to amend or waive certain of their financial covenants. So that's the sort of the inception of this wave of debt resets. And what are the ratios which are typically triggered? It's at the moment we're typically seeing it's the leverage ratio. And that's because uh, obviously, as you know, the leverage ratio is comprised of two parts. There's the amount of debt and there's the EBITDA. And in this current economic environment, a lot of borrowers are finding that their cash flow is actually severely curtailed. And so the EBITDA is going down. On top of that, when a lot of LBO debt documents are drafted, uh, the leverage ratio may actually ratchet. And what that means is that in the beginning, at the sort of early stages of the life of the debt, it's a relatively benign ratio and quite easy to meet. But over time, the, ra the ratio gets tighter. So it was expected, for example, that the cash flow would grow as the business was growing. And that was done often when the economic environment looked very rosy. Now that the environment has worsened, not only are borrowers' cash flows going down, but their ratios may be ratcheting as well, making it even harder to meet those leverage ratios. So, so it's this double whammy effect at the exactly, same time. Exactly. It's, it's a double whammy effect. And so that is causing borrowers a lot of problems. We're not seeing so much in this environment that interest cover ratios are being breached. And that's partly because the interest rates are still relatively low and they, the ratios were also set at a relatively friendly level um, at the top of the market. So that's what we're seeing. It's effectively people are forecasting breaches and they're also having tighter leverage ratios in many instances and therefore they think, I better do something about it now. So it's being proactive. Absolutely. Thank you. Now in terms of um, 
if I'm thinking about the debt structures, we've had heavy syndication during the market's heyday and uh, now finding ourselves with an array of different institutions in, in the debt structure um, with different strategies, investment strategies and goals. Um, now, for what and to what extent is consent needed among these groups? Well, you're absolutely right that there is a very broad array of investors in the debt market out there at the moment. And that's important to bear in mind because it can be hard to get consent from such a diverse array of investors. Just recapping who the investors can be, because it's important to bear in mind, uh, there there will be more depending on how many layers of debt there are. But let's assume it's a very multi-layered debt structure and you've got a senior facility and say a mezzanine facility with PIC as well. In the senior facility, the revolving facility will normally be provided by bank lenders. And if there is a facility A, that will typically be bank lenders as well. If there's a facility B and C, that was typically marketed at institutional investors and CLOs. If there's a second lien or facility D, then that will often be marketed and be held by mezzanine lenders and other investment funds. A mezzanine piece will also be held by mezzanine lenders and institutional investors. And a pick piece will typically be held by investors who want private equity type returns. So it's often private equity or other investment funds. And then you have to throw into the mix the fact that people will have bought debt on the secondary market as well. And if there are financial troubles coming up, sometimes arbitrageurs buy that debt. So there really can be a huge array of different lenders. So then coming on to the second point, which is, well, what consent do you need given this very diverse array of investors? If you want to reset your financial covenants, then typically in the European market, in a senior debt facility, you'll need consent of 66 and two thirds of lenders. Now that's 66 and two thirds of lenders across all the different facilities, so you aggregate it together. You may also need consent from your mezzanine lenders because typically in the European market, uh, there will be financial covenants in the mezzanine debt as well. They'll normally be set between 10 and 15% looser than in the senior facility. So it's quite a fine judgment as to whether you will actually need mezzanine consent to reset your financial covenants. And that will be something that a borrower and its advisors will have to judge quite carefully. If you do seek a mezzanine lender's consent, you will either need 66 and two thirds or sometimes 50.1% of consent. The other thing to bear in mind when looking at majorities like this is that at the top of the market, borrowers often manage to get into their documents a provision called a snooze and lose provision on voting. And what that means is that if a lender fails to respond to a request for a vote, its loan is not counted. Now that's obviously beneficial for borrowers because a failure to respond means there's less lenders from whom you have to get a 66 and two third majority. So that can sometimes be beneficial for lenders. Now on the other hand, if a borrower wants to extend its maturity date, in other words, to reschedule the final date of repayment of its debt, that almost always requires all lender consent. And not just, for example, senior lender consent if the borrower was just looking to put back its senior dates, it would almost always require a mezzanine lender consent as well. And that's normally drafted into the intercreditor agreement. So what that means as a practical matter is if you're a borrower that has a very broadly syndicated piece of debt and you want to extend your maturity, it might be almost impossible to achieve. And a borrower may very well have to look at alternatives like forward start financing, plan B, which can be all sorts of different things that Adam has alluded to. So to sum it up, there's a variety of different consent levels and also a variety of different considerations when looking at what consents are required for debt resets. So in addition to the headaches that one has with um, being on the brink of breaching a covenant or facing difficulty, there's just an absolute plethora of lenders you have to consider. I hadn't appreciated to what level of, of detail that needs to be looked into. One of the things that I've been hearing from some owners of, of companies that are backed by private equity is the cost of some of the things that we've been talking about, particularly the monitoring fees and the waivers themselves, can often be completely debilitating for a company that's already on the breach, um, on the brink, sorry, of breaching a covenant. Corinna, what are the usual costs involved with some of the things that you've been talking to us about? When looking at the mix of costs, uh, it's observable that the more equity that's injected, 
the less the amendment fees and the less the margin. And that's rationally consistent with a business that has slightly less leverage if it's got more uh, equity injected. Also, there's a tension between the amount of upfront amendment fees and the margin increases. So we've seen recently some very, very high amendment fees, sometimes up to 200 basis points. Uh, what happens then normally is that the margin increase is a little bit less than might otherwise be expected. The rationale for this arrangement is often that it costs the borrower less in the long term because the margin in the, in the long term is less high than it would otherwise have been and it provides lenders with an immediate upfront cash incentive to agree to the waiver and therefore everyone wins. So we've been seeing what seems like quite a lot of amendments being covered in the press. We've seen a lot of reports, especially in the broadsheets of companies in trouble, a lot of which are private equity backed as they were, as they were structured in the height of the credit boom. However, I assume that what we're reading is merely the tip of the iceberg. Going back, Adam, to what you said at the very beginning, there's nine trillion dollars due to be re, uh, refinanced in the next four years. That's a lot more than we're already reading about in the papers. Even if you achieve any of these things that we've been talking about, a waiver or a reset, is this actually allowing companies the ability to breathe more easily? Or might this simply be postponing more difficulties ahead? Adam, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, there's. Um, a there's a simple fact, which is that the, the fact of an amendment or a reset or whatever the company does will stave off an immediate cross default or immediate trigger for other lenders or the same lenders to come in and take more drastic action. So companies are going for the reset and they're, they're going for this right now because that's the best for them and uh, the, the lenders have come to the same view that it's in their interest at this point to do that. But it may just be a band-aid. That's absolutely true. It just must be a band-aid on a ma more major problem. And um, the, the closer that the uh, business is able to stick to its forecasts, or indeed better its forecasts, the greater the likelihood is that it will be able to come out of the current problems that it's facing. The banks don't want to um, go out there and restructure every single business that's out there. It's not good for the economy, it's not good for the banks themselves, they haven't got the bandwidth for it. Um, there's only a certain amount that you can do. So uh, you have to remember that uh, we are seeing a lot happening right now that partially turning into resets, partially turning into um, some sort of more major restructuring. And But it's the economy that's the key. If the economy flies, if the economy takes off, if the work that the, the leaders around the world are doing to stimulate the economy um, carries on and is successful, then I think that people in uh, the next couple of years will be breathe a sigh of relief. Otherwise, we could find ourselves with a deluge of more resets on top of resets. And, and, and anecdotally, we are seeing some of that already happening with the people, that, with the companies that had resets fairly recently having to talk to their bankers again because they didn't realise how bad the business was going to be and now that they can see the reality they're having to ask the bankers again for some more leeway. So the doom and gloom is actually even worse than I envisaged when I was coming into this interview um, but thank you anyway for taking the time to speak to us and enlighten us on what may be a band-aid solution. I've got with me today Adam Levin and Corinna Mitchell of Deckert, an international law firm, and I would also like to thank my colleague Emmanuel of Timu, both of us at Unquote. With nine trillion dollars to be reset in the next four years, and CFOs across the country of such companies being told that vigilance is key, we must all hope that what we're seeing now and what companies are undergoing is a real fix and not just a band-aid. Thank you very much for watching.